Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And as you're turning there, let me, let me ask you a question. Have you ever been involved in a lawsuit? Have you ever been involved in a lawsuit? Or maybe you know somebody who's been involved uh, in a lawsuit. The only lawsuit I can think of that I had any uh, uh, experience with would have been my parents' divorce. Divorce is considered even a lawsuit. My parents' divorce would have been a lawsuit, but maybe you've actually been in a lawsuit before. You've been in uh, a lawsuit over property, over a house, or over, over real estate, or over money, or over a job, or something that happened to you, been involved in a, a lawsuit, and you know, for the most part, by and by, lawsuits are nasty. Lawsuits are nasty. They're, they're not amicable at all. There's a lot of mudslinging that goes on during lawsuits. So the heading probably in your Bible, if you look at the heading above chapter 6, even in, on your phone of 1 Corinthians chapter 6, probably says something like lawsuits against believers or lawsuits against Christians or avoiding lawsuits against Christians. So this is the theme of this week's passage is avoiding lawsuits Amongst Christians. So we're going to back up in chapter 5, verses 12 through 13, and then pick up in verse 1 of chapter 6. <coughs> so look at chapter 5, verse 12. Paul says this. We, we ended with this passage last week. Paul says this. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Meaning I have no responsibility to judge, and no, not only no responsibility, I shouldn't, judge outsiders and then he says is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge verse 13 God judges God judges those outside purge the evil person from among you then pick up in verse 1 of chapter 6 when one of you has a grievance against another does he dare go to law before the unrighteous instead of the saints or do you not know that the saints will judge the world and if the world is to be judged by you are you incompetent to try trivial cases? Verse 3, do you not know that we are to judge angels? How much more then matters pertaining to this life? So if you have such cases, why do you lay them before those who have no standing in the church? And I say this to your shame. Can it be that there is no one among you wise enough to settle a dispute between the brothers? But brother goes to law against brother and that before unbelievers. To have lawsuits at all with one another is already a defeat for you. Why not rather suffer wrong? Why not rather be defrauded? But you yourselves wrong and defraud even your own brothers. And then verse 9, which will be preached next week, <coughs> it says this, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Listen to how the, the New Living Translation translates verses 8 and 9. He says, instead, you yourselves are the ones who do wrong and cheat even your fellow believers. Don't you realize that those who do wrong will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't fool yourselves. So it's a natural transition from, from uh, the end of chapter 5 into chapter 6. Uh, finishing today, verse 8, and then even into next week's passage, starting in verse 9. So he's making this natural transition. So verse 12 of chapter 5, he says, judge those within the church. Yes, you are to judge those within the church. And then verses uh, 1 through 8 of chapter 6, he says, you let others judge your disputes, and you yourselves wrong and defraud even your fellow brothers. And then it transitions into verse 9, and those who continually do wrong will not inherit the kingdom of God. Okay, so there's a natural transition. If you, were, if you, you probably already know this, but our Bibles were, were put into verses and chapters by much later dates than they were written. When Paul wrote this letter, he wrote it from verse 1 of chapter 1 all the way through the end of the letter. It's one letter that's obviously broken up in thought. If you were to, to write a paper for English... It's broken up in thought by the way that you, you use your punctuation, by the way that you use your paragraphs. But in the original text, there is no verse or chapter. So the people who 
compiled it and put it together, broke it up into that. So there's a natural transition that Paul is making from judging those within the church to then why do you submit to those, to other people judging you and allowing yourselves within your, can't you settle your own disputes? And then don't you know that if you treat people a certain way that you, and you continually do that, then you will not inherit the kingdom of God. That's where Paul's taking us. So the title of this message, we forgot to put it up on our PowerPoint. So the title of this message is you be the judge. Okay, you be the judge, broken up into four different points this morning. So the first one, which is uh, chapter 5, verse 12 that we talked about last week, says this, believers are to judge fellow believers in their conduct. So that's point number one. Believers are to judge fellow believers in their conduct. Point number two is believers are to judge the world. That's chapter 6, verse 2 that we'll be talking about today, that believers are to judge the world. Point number three is believers are to also judge the angels, That's verse three. And then finally, the main point of the passage is believers are to judge fellow believers in disputes. That's the whole section, verses one through eight. So right away, believers are to judge fellow believers in their conduct. We've talked about that. We talked about that last week. He says, is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? So believers do judge fellow believers. But then look at verses two and three of chapter six. Look at verses two and three. So Paul uses two examples to prove his main point of the message. His main point of the message is not that we are going to judge the world and that we are going to judge angels. That's not the main point of the message or the, or the whole passage. So he talks about that. He says, yes, believers will judge the world. Believers will judge angels. But the main point of this is it's his rebuke. And his rebuke isn't that, that believers are so great and they're so special that they're going to be these judges one day and they're going to judge the world and they're going to judge the angels. That's not what this passage is about. So we don't want to walk away thinking, sweet, we're going to judge the world and we're going to even judge angels. That's not what, that's not his main point. His main point is yes, because of our position in Christ, we're actually going to judge the world and we're actually going to judge angels. Yes. So how, he's saying this, so how in the world are believers not able to settle disputes within their own body. Why are you letting other people outside of the Christian church judge you? Why are you not able to take your disputes and settle them amongst the family of God? Why are you not? That's his main point. So let's briefly discuss these two examples that he uses to talk about this point, because it's in the scripture. It's not the main point, but we're going to talk about it. So Uh, The first one is believers will one day judge the world. That's what the passage says. Or do you not know, verse two, do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world is to be judged by you, you are in, are you incompetent to try trivial cases? So what was Paul referring to here? He, he, He was referring to this eternal kingdom, this eternal judgment. He was not talking about a literal judgment that, hey, now that you're Christians, you can sit and start judging the world. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about, he's already spoke about that in chapter five. We are not to judge those who are in the world. We're not to judge outsiders. Leave that to God. But there's gonna come when Jesus returns and he establishes his millennial kingdom that we will reign with him and we will judge the world alongside Christ. It's an eternal judgment in the eternal kingdom of God. The Bible talks about this in Revelation 3.21. It says, the one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. Daniel chapter seven, verse 22 says, and judgment was given for the saints of the Most High. And the time came when the saints possessed the kingdom. So this idea of judging in Revelation 2, verses 26 and 27. The one who conquers and who keeps my works until the end, to him I will give authority over all the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron, as when earthen pots are broken in pieces, even as I myself have received authority from my Father. So he's talking about that in the eternal kingdom, believers will judge the world, okay? So Paul is established one. He's using that as an example. Then the second example he uses, he, gets, he says, not only that, but guess what? Believers will actually judge angels. Believers are gonna judge angels. He says this in verse three. Do you not know that we are to judge angels? We're actually gonna judge angels. So what in the world does this mean, that we're gonna judge angels? Well, it's agreed amongst most Bible scholars 
that this judgment, which we don't know a lot about within Christendom, we don't know a lot about this. Well, what does it mean we're going to judge angels? But that's not the point that Paul's trying to make. But what does it mean that we're going to judge angels? Well, we don't know a lot about it. Most likely, it's going to be a judgment of the fallen angels. Maybe you've read Psalm 8.5, and some of the translations of Psalm 8.5 says this, you have made him, speaking of man, a little lower than the angels. And you might go, wait a minute, this sounds like it contradicts what Paul said. Paul said, you're actually going to judge the angels. But in Psalm, it says, wait, you made him a little lower than the angels. The word angels in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew language, is translated as Elohim. Elohim can mean supernatural beings or God himself. So to stay consistent with the scripture, which Paul's saying in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, that we will actually judge the angels, you would translate it as, and some of the translations do this, says that you have made him a little lower than the gods or than God. Okay, so that's a, a good translation. Uh, one commentator said an, an interesting statement about this idea that we'll judge angels. I thought this interesting, worth reading. He says this, the destiny of redeemed men and women to one day be higher than the angels and even to sit in judgment of them must greatly annoy a certain high angel in heaven. He did not want to serve an inferior creature now and did not want that inferior creature to be raised up higher than he. So he rebelled against God and is determined to keep as much of humanity as possible from sitting in judgment of himself. We can imagine the perverse, proud pleasure Satan takes over every soul that goes to hell because he can say, they won't sit in judgment over me. So the point Paul's trying to make, this is kind of our application of this, the point he's trying to make is that Corinthian believers, he's telling the Corinthian believers, listen, you will in fact have the authority to judge the world. You will in fact have the authority to even judge angels and the point is the same. The point is the same because you will judge the world, because you will judge angels, how much more, how much more should you be able to have a judgment, a settlement when there's disputing amongst yourselves in such trivial matters. You're gonna, don't you know this is what he's saying? Don't you know that you're going to judge the world and judge angels, and then yet even within your own body, you guys can't get along enough, and you have someone else on the outside come and make a judgment for you? He goes, that's ridiculous. Paul, another way he might even say this, right? He might even say, how pathetic. <laughs> how pathetic you guys are. How ridiculous that you can't work things out together as fellow brothers and sisters, members of the family of God. When you'll actually have the power and the authority to judge the world and angels, you can't even work things out yourself. You guys make me sick, is what Paul might even say. And this leads us into our final and main point of this passage. This is the final and main point of the passage, is believers are to judge fellow believers, make a settlement, uh, are to judge fellow believers in their disputes. We are to settle matters within the body of Christ. We're going to be judging the world and judging angels. How much more can we settle matters within this room even? That's his point. That we're to settle disputes within the body of Christ and not allow outsiders to be the ones that determine our fate. We do it. We do it. This is his point. So in Paul's day, the Greeks, and in particular the, the Athenians, they were known for being very involved in law and very involved in, in court. They held that in very high regard in the, the law courts in ancient Athens. Uh, it was very fundamental. The, the, the court of law was very fundamental in their governance, how they governed their city. According to Aristotle, he said, whoever controls the courts controls the state. And these courts were jury courts, and they were large ones. The smallest one had 200 members plus one in case there, uh, there was a, a, a debate or to avoid ties. Sometimes it would be 501. Sometimes it would be 1,001. Sometimes 1,501 people within this, this, uh, this court system. The annual pool of the jurors was comprised of 6,000 members and there's one reported case that they actually had 6,000 jurors 
try one case. So they held this idea of court and this idea of law in high regard. And then also Paul understood and the Jewish Christians understood there were Jewish Christians uh, permeating that, that church in Corinth. Not a lot. It wasn't predominantly Jewish Christians, but there were, would have been some Jewish Christians. And they understood that even under Jewish law, the Jews are allowed, it's called the Sanhedrin, it's their ruling court. The Jews were allowed to have their own ruling court within, within their system. The Roman Empire ruled everything else, but the Roman Empire even said, look, you can have your little court, and it, made up, it was made up, the Sanhedrin was made up of 71 ruling elders. They said, look, you can judge your own cases, you can do all that. But when it comes to us, the bigger things we're going to take care of, but yeah, you can have your own little law. So Paul understood this. The Jewish Christians in the congregation understood this. So this is the setting in which Paul says, y'all need to settle disputes within your own church. Y'all need to settle disputes amongst yourselves. So there are three basic considerations that I want to make for this final point, that believers should, dis to, should settle their disputes amongst themselves. So why? Why should they do that? Well, the first point, the first reason, number one, is believers settle disputes with other believers because it preserves their witness. Believers settle disputes with one another because it preserves their witness. So the Corinthian church was being looked at by outsiders as somewhat of a joke. The outsiders are looking at the Corinthian church going, man, that church is a joke. First of all, Paul had rebuked this church for being so divided. They were so divided. That's chapters one through four. They were so divided. Outsiders heard and they saw the division within the group and they said, man, what a joke of these Christians, these people who follow the way, who claim, who claim to be so united. Look at them. They're so divided. What a joke they are. Then Paul rebukes them because they were so arrogant in their dealing with sexual sin. And what was the sexual sin? A man sleeping with his stepmother and they're arrogant about it. And Paul says, not even the pagans, not even the outsiders allow such a thing. How ridiculous. So this hurts our witness. And then now Paul's saying this, he's rebuking them because of their inability to work things out together amongst themselves. And it hurts their Christian witness. The outside's looking in going, wow, what a joke. They are so, they are the most divided group of people. They, let, they claim that they're holy. They claim that they follow this Jesus that paid for their sins. And look, they just let all this sexual immorality permeate their body of Christ. And not only that, they can't even get along. They have disputes amongst one another, and they actually have to go to the secular court and the secular law and have them decide it for them. They can't even decide it themselves. Wow, what a joke. So that's what Paul's rebuking for them here. Because he says, so if you have such cases... Why do you lay them before those who have no standing in the church? You have a case with each other, but why are you laying them before those who are outside? And he says, I say this to your shame in verse 5. I say this to your shame. Can it be that there is no one even among you wise enough? Because remember, they claimed how wise they were. Is there no one even wise enough among you to settle this dispute between brothers? He says, no, but brother goes to law against brother. And that they do even before unbelievers. So the outside court would say something like this. Outsiders would say something like this about this Corinthian church. Wow. <laughs> wow. Have you seen these folks who call themselves Christians? Have you seen these people? Have you seen the way that they talk to each other and the way that they treat each other? There's all kinds of division amongst them. They don't even bat an eye when there's a guy in their congregation engaged in sexual immorality, sleeping with his stepmother. They don't do anything about it. Wow. And they can't even get along enough to settle trivial disputes amongst themselves. They fight and they bicker with each other. Man, I am glad that I am not part of that group. What a shame. What a shame. So what is our witness? What is our witness? What is the witness of the anchor? What do others say about us? Do they think we're some kind of a, a cult? <laughs> Maybe. Our first MC was great. Very first MC of this church was at our house, 
in December of 2015. And we sat around a room and Katie said, hey, I'm glad y'all are here. Just want to let you know that we have a chicken in the back. We're going to be cutting its head off today and uh, sacrificing its blood. And we got a laugh out of a few, but I think a few probably never came back. Corbin and Tristan are still here. First one, Ramon and Claudia. But do some people, do they think we're like some kind of a cult, right? Do they think that we're, we're some kind of a, a Christian clique? Ooh, look at that. We talked about it last week, this little holy huddle. Look at that little Christian clique over there. What is the anchor, anchor known for? What are we known for? Well, I would say praise God, and of course I'm biased, but praise God, the testimony that I've heard pretty much without fail, and we're not, nobody's perfect. I mean, we're, we're people, and we make up this group. But I have heard over and over and over about you, about you in this church that, man, they really are a community of people. They really are a community of people that they seem to really love one another. They really are a community of people that really, when they say they do life together, to a degree, they really do. They really do. When they say that they want to be the church and not do church, I see that. Testimony after testimony. There was a guy I was going to have do it today, but he's out of town. Wanted to have him give up and say, hey, tell tell us your testimony. You've been here nine months now. Tell us how you got here and tell us what this has meant to you. He has sent me several text messages and emails to just encourage, hey, man, the anchor has changed my wife and I's life. Y'all are, y'all are doing something good. Not perfect, but y'all are doing something good. So I understand I'm biased, and I'm not saying this with arrogance. I'm saying this with gratitude. I'm saying this with gratitude to you all and to the Lord to say, Lord, wow, as messed up as we are, it's, it's kind of working. You know, not, we don't have a formula, but that, that, Lord, we really want to be a community of believers that come together and we're just a family. So I think that's what people will say about the anchor, and I'm so grateful for that. And then how about you as an individual? What's your personal witness? What do people say about you? <clears throat> do non-believers see a divisive spirit in you? Do they see division? Is that what they see? Do you... Non-believers see a life of immorality. Yeah, yeah, they go to church and they, they talk a good game, but I know how they really live. Is that what they see? Do they see a life of immorality? Or do they see a life that's dedicated to a man who died for them, who died for them, paid the penalty for their sins so that they could live and so, so that they could live for him by denying their flesh? Do non-believers see disputing? disputing. I don't know this. I don't know if this is the case in this room right here. I hope not. But is it possible that you've thought about taking someone to court in this room? Is it, is it possible that you've thought about taking another believer to court because they wronged you so bad? Julie, don't look at Austin and smile. <laughs> is it possible that, that you have have considered that? Is it possible it's happened to you? Is it possible that you've already done it? You've sued a believer. This is what Paul's talking about. You cannot sue a believer. You cannot do it. It crushes your witness. You cannot do it is what Paul's saying. He's saying, work it Work it out amongst yourselves. If you can't work it out amongst yourselves, bring a couple more Christians with you and work it out together, if that's what we need to do, according to Matthew chapter 18. Because why? Our witness is all that we really have. At the end of the day, that's all you and I have. That's literally what Jesus died for. That's literally why Jesus saved you and saved me, is for our witness. That's it. It's for our witness. Our witness is why Jesus has left us here. That's why we're still here. It's for our witness. What's your witness? After his death and after his resurrection and right before his ascension into heaven where he sits at the right hand of the Father even to this moment, right before that, he says, you will be my witnesses. You are my witnesses. You are my representatives on earth. So what's your witness? So number one, 
Number one, believers settle their disputes with other believers because why? It preserves their witness. It preserves their witness. And then number two, believers settle disputes with other believers because it shows Christ-like humility. We settle disputes with other believers in the context of the church because why? Because it shows our Christ-like humility. He says this in verse seven. <coughs> Not an easy thing to hear. Maybe easy to say, but hard to do. He says this in verse seven. Why not rather suffer wrong? Why not rather suffer wrong? Why not rather be defrauded? That shows humility. You ever been wronged? Taken advantage of? And you didn't retaliate? That's what he says. Why not rather suffer wrong? Why not rather be defrauded? It's easy to say, but I know it's hard to do. But there's no way around this statement. There's no way around what this says and what this means. It doesn't mean something different. It says what it means and it means what it says. There's no way around the teaching of the gospels of Jesus. There's no way around it. Jesus would say this. Why not rather suffer wrong? Why not rather be defrauded? Summed up in the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do to you. It doesn't say this. It says, do unto others as you would have them do. It doesn't say, don't do to others what you don't want them to do to you. That's not what it says. That's not the golden rule. That's not the passage that, that's not what Jesus says. That's not his statement in the Sermon on the Mount. He says, do unto others what you would have them do to you. So when I have wronged someone, when I have wronged someone, as a believer, I desperately want them to forgive me. Ha, when I've wronged someone, I want them to forgive me, and I even expect it. I expect it as a believer. I expect you to forgive me. Do I do unto them as I would have them do unto me when I've been, when, when I've, uh, been wronged? And then when I've been defrauded, do I want to defraud them back? Or do I settle it with them? And if necessary, in the presence of some other believers, do I settle it with them? Or do I do unto them as I would have them do unto me? What do I do? If they've, I want them to forgive me. I want them to forgive me. And I expect them to forgive me. Do I do unto them as I would have them do unto me? The world says this, hey, when you're wronged, wrong back. Man, wrong back. When you're defrauded, when you've been taken advantage of, man, you defraud back. Synonyms of being defrauded. Some fun words here. Swindled, cheated, robbed, deceived, duped. Hoodwinked. Double-crossed, fooled, tricked, conned, bamboozled. Ripped off, taken for a ride, pulled a fast one on, taken to the cleaners. When that's happened to you, do you just want to retaliate? It's our nature to retaliate. That's who we are apart from Christ. It's our nature. Our heart is desperately wicked and sick. Who can understand it? Our nature would be absolutely, I'm getting them back. I'm getting them back. Maybe even in the moment, I'm going to get them back as quick as I can. Or I'm going to plan how to get them back. That's what the world says. So this is impossible to respond with Christ-like humility. Impossible. Impossible to do it with Christ-like humility. It's impossible to have this kind of humility if we don't have Christ. It's impossible if you have not submitted your life to the leading of the Holy Spirit. It is impossible to respond with Christ-like humility. We sang that song, Oh, How I Need You. Ha! You don't say, oh, how I need you. I have suffered wrong, and in my flesh I want to retaliate, but Lord, how I need you. I can respond with Christ-like humility. That's what the Bible's saying. He says that. Why not rather just suffer wrong than take it to court? Just suffer wrong. Take it to court. 1 Peter 2, Juice read this, 1 Peter 2, verses 18 through 23. I'm going to read the whole thing. Juice read verses 19, 19 through uh, 22 uh, before, between his two songs. Listen to what it says, starting in verse 18. Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to do the good 
and gentle, but also to the, uh, to the unjust. Verse 19, for this is a gracious thing. This is a gracious thing. When mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. It's a gracious thing to suffer unjustly and to endure it. It's what the Bible's telling us. For what credit is it if when you sin, you're beaten for it that you endure? There's no credit for that. You sinned. He says, but if, but if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to you, or excuse me, for to this you have been called. This is your calling, brother and sister in Christ, to suffer wrong and to not retaliate, he's saying, because Christ suffered for you. Because Christ suffered for you, it says, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. Verse 22, he committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. Yet he suffered. Yet he suffered. And then verse 23, when he was reviled, he didn't revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten. But what? Continued entrusting himself to him who judges rightly. So believers settle disputes with other Christians because it shows Christ-like humility. We endure suffering because we're called to it, it says. We endure it because we're called to it. Because Jesus did it. And it's a gracious thing to endure this suffering. We don't revile back or threaten in return. But what do we do? We continue entrusting God who is our just judge. We just continue trusting him. So that's why Paul can say, hey, why not rather suffer wrong than actually take your dispute outside? And then finally, the third point of why we should do this is believers settle disputes with other believers because it shows brotherly love. That's why we do it, because it shows brotherly love. This is the main point of the whole passage. The overarching umbrella of this passage is because it shows brotherly love. It's something you couldn't do on your own. It's brotherly love. So brotherly love settles matters internally. That's what brotherly love does. Brotherly love says, hey, we can settle this. We don't have to go to the court. Even if it's a money issue, it's a financial issue. If it's a character issue, it's a, if it's a property issue, hey, we can settle this amongst ourselves because of brotherly love. We can do this. We can do this. Have you ever heard of families that are torn apart because they can't settle their disputes amongst each other and they have to take someone to court? My wife, Katie, is a Judge Judy junkie. She's a triple J. She's a Judge Judy junkie. I mean, she's watched every episode. And 50% of those episodes are between family members taking a family member to court. You know what happens when you take a family member to court? Tears your family apart. Fragments your family. Destruction, bitterness, unforgiveness is the result when a family member takes another family member to court. Paul's saying, you're the family of God. You can't take each other to court. Work it out amongst yourselves. If you need some help with other Christians, a mediator to help in the dispute, you, you do that. You call them and say, hey, let's work this out together. You don't take it to court. Ridiculous, right? This is the family of God. We're called to a higher standard. God calls believers to a higher standard, a standard of being able to love each other so much that we can settle matters internally. Even as much as it hurts, we can settle them internally. We wouldn't dare take a fellow believer to court. We wouldn't dare do it. Why? Because of our love for them. It's our brotherly love for them. And if we can't work it out, like I said, between just the two of us, we'll get some other brothers or sisters to, to mediate with us. So number one, brotherly love settles matters internally. Number two, brotherly love is willing to suffer wrong. That's what we just got through talking about. Brotherly love is willing to suffer wrong. That's Paul's point. What if you've been wronged by a believer? What if you've been de defrauded by a believer? Is it possible to suffer wrong and even to not take them to court and to not retaliate against them? Is this possible? Well, it's not possible without Christ, but it's totally possible with Christ. 
First Peter, he talks a lot about this suffering because why? He talks about in his in his letter that he writes, First Peter, he's writing to a group of people who are going to be persecuted for their faith. And he says, man, endure in your suffering. Endure. These people are going to have their families ripped apart. These people are going to uh, be martyred. They're going to have their heads cut off. They're going to have their skin ripped off their bodies. They're going to have their limbs ripped off for, the, for their faith in Christ. And he goes, hey, persevere. So he talks a lot about this. He says this in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. He says, finally, all of you, all of you believers, have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling. He's talking about, hey, when someone comes and snatches your kid and kills them because of your faith, don't retaliate. So Paul would say in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, hey, can't y'all settle disputes amongst yourselves? We're not killing each other. Can't you settle disputes? He says, do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless those. Bless them, for this is what you've been called to, that you may obtain a blessing. But even if you should suffer, even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed, for it's better to suffer for doing good if that should be God's will than for doing evil. It's like in our marriage. Do you want to be right? Husbands and wives, do you want to be right or do you want to get along? Do you want to be right or do you want to get along? Being willing to be wronged for the sake of peace. It's hard, I know. It's hard. Live it every day. Every day. Married couples, we know. But do we want to be right or do we want to have peace? I'm preaching to myself here. Being willing to be wronged for the sake of peace is way better than being right. Way better than justice in the moment. You've heard the saying, shalom in the home. That should be our marriage motto. Shalom in the home. Right? Peace in the home. It's not easy. I know it's not always easy. But it's always the right thing. Even seeking peace over justice. Seeking peace over justice is the right thing. Why? We agape? We agape because he agaped us. We agape because he agaped us first. We give unconditional love. We love that is not deserved. We love that is not earned. We love that stoops down even being willing to be wronged and defrauded, we do that, why? Because he has given us unconditional love. He has given us undeserved love. He has given us unearned love, a love that stooped down and came down to save a wretch like me. That's his love. That's agape love. That's what we're called to. We agape because he first agaped us. So we're gonna finish with this. We're gonna finish with just reading scripture on this. Juice pick some scriptures to start the service with, and then the scripture that we read in First Peter between the songs. So they, some of that is here. But I want, I want you to turn, first of all, I want you to turn to First John chapter 4, and I want you to follow along in this passage about brotherly love. This is the overarching umbrella of this passage and of this message is you are willing to do all of these things because of brotherly love. Because God first loved you, you can do it. That's what it's saying. So go to 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 21. We'll skip around a little bit, but I'll tell you as we go through. But let's just start in, in verse 7. He says this. And John, this is the apostle John. He was the apostle of love. Says this. 1 John Chapter 4, starting in verse 7, he says, Beloved, let us, let us love one another. For love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God. Because God is love. Verse 9, in this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and he sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. We love because he first loved us. <clears throat> Verse 11, beloved, 
If God so loved us, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. Skip down to verse 16. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love and whoever abides in love abides in God and God abides in him. By this is love perfected with us so that we may be, we may have confidence for the day of judgment because as he is so, also are we in this world. Verse 18, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. Verse 19, we love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God, if anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. He's a liar. For he who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. Romans 12, 9 and 10 says this, let love be genuine, abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good, love one another with brotherly affection, outdo one another in showing honor. And then finally, turn to the love chapter of, of the Bible. Interestingly enough, it's 1 Corinthians chapter 13, gets read a lot at weddings, the love chapter. Interestingly, that the love chapter of the entire Bible, and there's a lot, we just read a whole passage on love, but this is called the love chapter of the Bible, is in the midst of a letter that Paul is just rebuking. He's just rebuke, rebuke, rebuke. We've been ha getting hammered every single week in here, right? Hammered, hammered, hammered. The love chapter is in the same letter. Paul kind of, I think maybe he kind of sneaks it in there and says, oh, wait a minute, let me just, let me tell you about love. Let me, I've, been he I've been beating up on you guys. Let me tell you about love. So go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. It's the opening passage that Juice led with this morning. We're going to read, he stopped, uh, I believe, at verse 7. We're going to read through verse thir uh, 11 and then 13. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. We're ending with this. We're almost done. But we're just letting the word speak. This is what the word says about love. This is what the word says about love. He says, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, so I have the gift of this angelic tongue, but I have not love, I'm just a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. He says, and if I have prophetic powers and I understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to even move mountains, I have faith that can move mountains, but have not love, I'm nothing. If I give away all that I have, if I sell all my possessions, I give everything away for the sake of the gospel, I give it all away. And if I even deliver up my body to be burned as a martyr, take my life, Christ. When faced with a martyr's decision, he says, even if I've done that, but I have not love, I gain nothing. Why? Verse four, love is patient and it's kind. Love, it doesn't envy or boast. It's not arrogant or rude. It doesn't insist on its own way. Right? That's why we can settle disputes because we don't insist on our own way. It's not irritable or resentful. It has no resentment in it. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but it rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things. It believes all things, hopes all things. It endures all things. Love never ends. Verse 11, he says this, when I was a child, I spoke like a child and I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I gave up my childish ways. He says, I've died to my old life of divisiveness. I've died to my old life of immorality. And I've even died to my old life of trying to settle disputes outside of the body of Christ. That's what he's saying. That's when I was a child, I acted like that, but not anymore. And then verse 13, so now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, but the greatest of these is love. This is the word of God. Believers settle disputes with other believers because it shows brotherly love. That's why. That's why. It shows that we love one another. We love one another. Jews quoted uh, John chapter 13, 34, and 35, and then when Josh comes up here, he's gonna, that's the passage he's going to use to lead us in communion. But they're going to know we're disciples by our love for one another. By our love for one another. 
So they settle disputes from within because why? It preserves their witness. And they settle disputes from within because it shows Christ-like humility. And they settle disputes from within because it shows brotherly love. Brotherly love. Pray with me if you will, please. Yes, Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. We know that this is a love that comes from you. It's an agape love. And because you love us, we can love others. Period. That's it. So, Father, would we preserve our witness to a world who's mocking us and laughing at us and saying, wow, what a joke they are. Will we preserve our witness with Christ-like humility, with brotherly love, with settling things within? Because that's what you're telling us to do. We believe that. We believe that. So, Father, we ask in Jesus' name that you would convict us where we need conviction, encourage us where we need encouragement this morning. And as Josh comes up to lead us in communion, would we spend that time just to reflect on what you, you have done on the cross for us to even make this possible. And uh, we thank you, and it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Matt and Courtney will be standing in the back if you would like to go back there for prayer, maybe as a couple, individually, uh, whatever it might be.